Greetings. Prophet of Zod here. Because this video deals with my old pastor and boss, I want to be very clear about something before we start. This video was not made out of any kind of grudge or personal spite. Instead, it's the product of having spent years watching him make arguments that, even as a Christian, I found manipulative to the point that they had to have either been disingenuous or irresponsibly sloppy, and now I feel it's time to address them. So that said, let's fire things up and see what he has to offer in terms of apologetics. Um, I just want to welcome you all one more time uh, as we celebrate the most globally impacting, the most life-impacting event in all of history. The Neolithic Revolution? Yeah, that's probably not what he's going to say, is it? You know, if you're not a Christian, I want you to understand that Christianity is the one religion on the face of the earth that has nothing to do with religion. Religion is about rituals and about rules. How many candles can I light? How many prayers can I chant? How many stories can I invent that start with the words, well, I believe. That's religion. Christianity has nothing to do with that. It's about a relationship with the God of heaven. Hmm. So he kicks things off with the age-old strategy of invoking an artificially narrow definition of religion, then using semantics to make his congregation feel like everybody else is religious, but we're not, because we're the ones who are really all about a personal relationship with God. I have to say, this is off to a pretty vanilla start. Surely he's about to work his way into something better. And Christianity is founded upon the most important historical event since the creation of the world. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And unlike Islam or Buddhism or Confucianism or Mormonism or Hinduism or Scientology or countless others, the Christian faith is based upon actual, factual, historical events. Okay, now that's something we can work with. Of course, I've heard a lot of apologists over the years make the same lame attempts at proving there's historical evidence for God, but I'm sure this time everything will be different. This time, Pastor's going to ride to the rescue and provide the clear, unquestionable, world-shaking evidence nobody else has managed to come up with yet. And surely he won't just stand there and patronize his congregation with vague assertions and verbal sleight of hand. Right? Right? Oh, who am I kidding? This is going to be a train wreck, and we all know it. People who are ignorant of the Bible always talk about errors and various ways, you know, a lot of different interpretations. You know, l l listen to this. There is not a single disputed wording in Scripture, not a single disputed line that has any bearing on any foundation of the Christian faith. Not even one. Anywhere. Uh, yeah, this is very much not true. If it were, I would ask why there's such a vast tangle of denominations and subdenominations within Christianity many of whom sincerely disagree on even the most important parts of Christian doctrine. The Bible is a disorganized mess of confusing mixed messages, forcing Christians of different stripes to sift through for parts that suit them and say the rest don't count because of context, leaving the more arrogant fundamentalists to assert that their reading is so clearly and indisputably backed up by Scripture that Christians who disagree are just refusing to hear what the Bible says. I don't have time to dig into the Bible on this, but for some general idea, you can look through my remedial Bible lessons, especially the one exploring its confusing treatment of the most foundational teaching of all, salvation. The Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic is utterly reliable. You see, what there aren't many interpretations of the Bible. What there are, there are many people who don't like what the Bible says, and so they invent their own interpretation. That's what there really is. And this is precisely the kind of arrogance I was talking about. The Bible isn't complicated. Nobody sincerely misunderstands it. There are just people like us who read it properly, and then all the other people who twist it because of the wickedness in their heart. I hope people in his congregation can start to see how damaging and self-serving this kind of rhetoric is. God said it. 
The question is, are you willing to believe it, to take him at his word? If you're skeptical, uh, please listen to this. Uh, Of all of the hundreds of thousands of archaeological finds, and these items of antiquity also date back thousands of years, of the hundreds of thousands of finds in the Middle East, there is not one single name or date or place or event in all of Scripture that has ever been proven to be wrong. Now, surely, if the Bible is full of errors, one archaeological find over the last hundreds of years of the hundreds of thousands of finds should contradict at least one, wouldn't you think? Would it really? I'm skeptical of your expectation that archaeology disprove a book about things happening in vaguely described places once upon a time. If using archaeology to prove the Bible were like looking for a single needle buried in the middle of a desert, using it to disprove the Bible would be like trying to demonstrate there's no needle anywhere in the desert. It's ridiculous. I could chase all over the Middle East trying to disprove the Bible, and all Christians would have to do is keep telling me I'm at the wrong place and the evidence is somewhere else. It's a never-ending moving target. And what's worse, apologists have had centuries to refine their excuses for anything we've found that is problematic. And trust me, there are plenty of things in the Bible that at least apparently contradict the archaeological record. For one, as I mentioned in one of my remedial Bible lessons, archaeology demonstrates that crop cultivation, animal domestication, and metalworking were developed gradually over several thousand years of trial and error. Yet Genesis states that these skills were used in more or less complete form by the earliest humans. On top of this, we see human civilizations thriving uninterrupted through the time in which the whole world was supposed to have been flooded. And Exodus describes a conservatively estimated 2 million Israelites wandering through the desert for 40 years, making use of natural as well as supernatural water sources. But where is there any sign of springs or lakes large enough to be of any help to such a large population? Where is the absurd volume of archaeological evidence such a massive migration should have left scattered across the desert? And these questions only scratch the surface. Now I know Christians have excuses for all these disparities, and my goal isn't to conclusively argue that they prove the Bible is false. But the book at least appears to have its problems, which Christians have wrestled with for generations, at best coming up with tenuous rationalizations to quell their doubts. So forgive me if it comes off as presumptuous when you thump your chest and tell atheists they've never found the smallest shred of proof against your holy book. But the truth is that atheist, non-Christian archaeologists in the Middle East, when trying to decide where to dig, have as their primary textbook, they don't believe that it's true, but they believe that it's true. I mean, it isn't true, but if I'm going to try to figure out where to dig, where I have a good chance of finding, then I would, then the primary source, and there are others, but the primary source book is this. It's the Bible. Boy, this remark is so problematic on so many levels, it's hard to know where to begin. First, archaeology is way more complicated than pastors trying to make it sound. Archaeologists make use of many different tools, including the texts of different religions and cultures, sifting through volumes of useless or nonsensical information to find the tiniest of clues. The Bible, as far as it actually gets used in archaeology, is but one of these many tools. And by the way, I would question his unsubstantiated remark that it's the main one. But that aside, even if you think it's the 100% true word of God, all you have to do is browse through the Bible, giving the question any real thought, and you'll quickly realize that his narrative of archaeologists running around navigating the Middle East with a copy of the Bible in hand is pretty silly. The book just isn't that specific about where things are at. I mean, just consider how many places people have claimed to have found Noah's Ark, or how many sites are today advertised as Jesus' tomb, the site of his ascension, or the well where he met the Samaritan woman, and on and on and on. If the Bible was of any use in locating things, these issues should have been resolved quickly and easily. What's more, even if archaeologists did use the Bible to the extent he's indicating, his little shtick of saying, they don't believe that it's true but they believe that it's true, abuses language by taking two very different ideas. On one hand, the idea that the Bible is a cultural document that might be useful for finding relics, 
and on the other the belief that it's the infallible word of God, and conflating them under the wording, it's true. Then, once he's jumbled these definitions in the mind of his audience, he uses this ambiguity to imply that an archaeologist who uses the Bible for any kind of reference for anything is inconsistent if he also isn't a fundamental Christian. But this is ridiculous. Heinrich Schliemann used the text of Homer to locate a city at the site of Troy. But this doesn't mean that he thought Achilles was trained by a horseman, that Zeus rained blood or lightning upon the Trojan battlefield, or that Odysseus traveled to the underworld to meet a prophet. He thought there might be a core of historical reality to the legends surrounding the Trojan War, and that the text that contained these legends might also hold clues for the location of various city sites. But he still knew the stories were legends. This is a very reasonable and common approach to take. People use cultural and religious texts from all around the world for many various forms of reference without believing in the associated religions. This is so obvious that I have to assume that Pastor is either being disingenuous about archaeologists' motivations or simply doesn't want to bother trying to understand them. Finally, I'd like to add a broader concern, which is that this represents an insidious strategy of portraying people outside your religion, even very educated, intelligent people who specialize in the field you're discussing, as being cartoonishly dim-witted or morally deficient. In this case, it's the image of all those atheistic archaeologists out there who recognize the truth of the Bible in as far as it's useful for their work, but still deny its teachings. Not, of course, for any good reason, or even any reason we might not understand, but because of flagrant hypocrisy and denial, the foolishness of which is obviously evident both to the pastor and his congregation. There's no room for shades of gray here. No room for recognizing that these archaeologists just might understand something on this question that we don't. We here in our church know what's going on. We're privy to the secrets, and everyone else is dead wrong. What's more, it's us against all of them, including the so-called experts, because we're on the side of good, and they're on the side of darkness. It's classic fortress mentality. Again, if the Bible says something happened in a particular place at a particular time, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of individual finds have confirmed it to be true. And not one ever has disproven a single name, a single date, a single place, or a single event. If you're skeptical, that should mean something to you. No, if you're skeptical, you should wonder why a pastor would try to make you think that an ancient culture's ability to point out physical locations proves that their religion is true, and why he would use this silly premise to isolate you from outside ideas by demonizing or ridiculing the academic experts in the field that he's discussing. Whether or not you're a Christian, if you have even the slightest shred of skepticism, that should mean something to you.